We are back on Morning Line. Thanks for joining us on this Wednesday. My guest, guest with us this morning is uh, Dr. Anna, Sett Anna Settle. Uh, she's a licensed psychologist, uh, forensic psychologist as well, has worked with uh, um, folks behind bars as well. So I'm glad to have you on this morning. As you see, we're talking about the Kentucky school shooting. The phone number's there on the screen. The day after, um, we discussed a bit about the, uh, the suspect in this case, and we're still waiting to learn more about that from the FBI, but also the grieving process as well. I was going to touch bases with her on that, but we have several calls. I'll squeeze a few of those in. Okay. But a lot of people right now grieving, and, and she can comment on those steps as well. Let's go to Lucy. Hi, Lucy. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, first, I would like to say my heart goes out to Marshall County, Kentucky. And I would just like to look at this also from maybe the shooter's angle, uh, because over the years we always do focus on the victim, and rightfully so. But, you know, I don't have social media. I, I agree with everything that your first caller, Joe, said. I think that social media is destroying our society in this country, not just democracy, but our social skills. And it's just so easy to, to use social media, media sure. for your social skills instead of developing some of your own. But uh, I've got a question for the doctor and I've got a comment. When I was a kid, uh, 15 was 15. It was hard back then and it's hard now. But I remember what my father said in the back of my head all the time because I saw several examples of this. Don't go picking on people, messing with people, because you don't know what they're going through. And my dad would say, if somebody slaps you, shoots you, or stabs you because you picked on them, you deserved it. And you'll grow up and you'll learn one day what life is about. And so being a teenager, I understand that it's hard and what your perceptions may sure. be or may not be, you know, how you look at the world. Uh, with that being said, uh, you know, you can corner a rat and poke at it with a stick, and that rat will come out of that corner and tear you up before you know it. So uh, could the good doctor uh, get the definition of psychotic, please, <laughs> and I'll hang up and take your comments <laughs> off the air. Okay. Psychotic? I guess. All right. So the definition of psychotic is somebody who's experiencing hallucinations or delusions. So that would okay. be somebody who is hearing voices or seeing things or is under the impression that they are being victimized. Like for example, and I'm speculating and don't necessarily or actually don't believe this is what happened, but if this shooter had gone into that school and thought that these students were government employees that were mm. coming after his family and he shot them, that would be a symptom of psychosis. Okay. So that, that rarely ever happens. Okay, so psychosis is one thing. Um, the other elements that could come into play for someone like this that would drive him, if he's not psychotic, um, he could be though um, just, if he's suffering from bullying, okay, um, or especially, and she hit on this, the cyber bullying. Right. It, it's so much more difficult now. It used to be in the old days they call you names as you walk down the hallway. Now they can post horrible things for you online. It can be a bunch of people. It's hard to even know who your target is. So what he gets so angry, potentially anyone, in this case or others, that he just lashes out at a whole group as opposed to just one individual who keeps poking on him, he goes and shoots the one person. This seemed to me to be pretty random. Right. I don't think he went in there and specifically was looking for, he just started shooting. That's right. So what mindset would that be? He's just got a general anger? Possibly, and also at that age, students don't recognize the impact, the long-term impact of what's happening and what mm. they're doing. So I think, you know, as an, an older adult, we can sort of see what the, the, the fallout from that is gonna look like. Right. Students are so, at that age, yeah. ad adolescents, are sort of impulsive, and so they go in and they think about the act itself, but they don't really understand what's gonna happen afterwards. You are exactly right. I've been in court before when they come in and they're young. And you can tell, initially, they have no idea what they've done. And then it's laid out and they realize their life is essentially over. over. Yes. All of a sudden it hits them. And that, that's the nature of young people. And I think that's one reason, maybe with good reason, and people will debate this, that if he's convicted, if he did this, he faces life in prison, not the death penalty. They don't execute kids that commit crimes. Right. So let's go next to uh, Melinda. Hi, Melinda. Are you there, Melinda? Oh, yes, I am Hey, here. go ahead. What's on your mind? Okay, this is uh, my uh, comment. Yeah. I believe that 
that behavior that that boy um, demonstrated, the violence and the cruelty, is just a reflection of the very nature of the white man. And anyone who lives under the system of a white man is going to inherit those same tendencies towards violence. Did you say under the white man? Yes, it's the nature of the white man to be violent. Cool. Well, I disagree. I'm not like that. Um, you know, I think it's it, th th these types of crimes transcend all race, color, creed, age. Correct? Right. Okay. There is no white man syndrome or black man syndrome, is there not? Plenty of uh, white commit crimes, plenty of blacks do, plenty of age, right? I right. just want to clarify that. All right. So let's go next to Elaine. Hello, Elaine. Hi. Hey, what's on your mind? Well, I tell you, I am sitting here boiling mad. Hmm. My heart goes out to Marshall County. My granddaughter, and I know you've heard this a hundred times from me, yeah. was 11 years old. A 12 year old shot her in the back, hitting her heart and her lungs because she looked at him and said, don't you know not to point guns at people. Hmm. He killed her. That was the last word she spoke. He is walking free. He is in Lincoln County School. How old was he again? She was 11. Okay. He was 12 years old. And so, yeah, and that, now that was young. And, and she's called in before on that count. But I understand her anger. Now, 12, is there that big a difference, I, I, would you imagine, between, um, you know, prosecuting a 12-year-old? And it sounds to me, if he's out free right now, having done that, that that he was not transferred to adult court. That's right. There is a difference just because of the cognitive development and right. the difference between 12 and 15. Because of that age. Okay, that's, right. that's a great point. Now, would you imagine in this case as a 15-year-old committing this crime, would you be involved if you were talking to one of these suspects with the decision-making process after you interviewed them whether or not they would be tried as an adult? I would not. That would be okay. a legal decision. Okay, but what would they base that on? Would they base that on, you know, would I, I, there's no doubt this guy's going to be tried as an adult. It's just no doubt. If not, there'll be a huge outcry. But what would the factors be, would you imagine, to determine whether or not someone should be tried as an adult? Beyond just this is an adult crime. Right. It usually is the seriousness of the crime. If that's number that's one, right. isn't it? Yes. Okay. Then does it have anything to do with then their intellect or their level of understanding? Yes, absolutely. So if he were, if he had an intellectual disability and, and was functioning at a lower level, he certainly would not be tried as an adult. Okay. So that may be something they're checking on this individual now. As, as she says, he's likely being questioned for sure right now. That's right. Yeah. Let's go to William. Hi, William. Bill, are you there? Hello, William. He's on line six. Yeah. Hey, William, you better go. Let's go. Okay. You know, all these children, you know, have to come down to one thing. I blame the government. You know, if people, maybe if they talk freely, somebody might pick up what somebody is saying wrong. But if they don't say it, then they're going to go and act out on it. I think the freedom of speech is at their attack. Let people talk. There's nothing wrong with that. I know they're going to have a bunch of FBI over there trying to find out, but that's not what we need. You know, mm -hmm. when something happens, we need to prevent it. Well, that's right, and I didn't make out everything he said, but I mean, having someone to talk to. I wonder, too, in these cases, how often any of these kids, if they're loners, had anyone to talk to. That's right. And it's not, if they don't have any friends, is the parents know? Would the parents just, I don't know, I mean... How, how big a role can the parents play in all this? Do you ever end up talking to the parents? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, they're the first line of defense. So they are the, they are the people that usually identify some sort of issue that can get the child or adolescent help. If they're engaged. If they are engaged, yeah, that's right. Although, I will say, too, I mean, schools are doing a really good job of providing school counselors and providing yeah. education around bullying. So I don't think we're being completely oblivious and remiss in talking to kids that we're identifying as potentially being violent. Yeah. All right, let's take a break on that note. More phone calls, and uh, when we come back, uh, I'm going to ask the good doctor here just a little bit more about, you know, what's going to be happening there in Kentucky today um, with some of these people that are dealing with just horrible grief. I can't even imagine the parents of, of the children that were killed. We'll take a break and be back right after this.